Um, so, uh, as a couple of sort of, I think, probably very quick announcements, um, there were a lot of uh, emails and announcements that I made on Canvas over the past couple of days. Please read through those and make sure, uh, let me know if you have any questions uh, about, uh, about the assignments and, uh, um, and about uh, the homework that was due yesterday, right, Wednesday, uh, in uh, um, uh, and the um, quiz that was graded and so on and so forth. Um, uh, one other announcement is that uh, there's up on Canvas now and due on this coming Wednesday, five days from today, uh, another homework assignment. Um, it's longer than the most recent one. The most recent one was pretty short. Uh, this is a longer homework assignment. Um, sorry, do you have questions about this? Okay. <laughs> Um, that was a longer homework assignment. The one that's due Wednesday is a bit longer, so be sure to sort of look ahead and plan ahead over the weekend for that. Um, there will not be a homework for the next Wednesday because the next Wednesday is the test. Um, so we're putting up topics guys about that. About it's uh, after mid semester break. Um, oh, yeah, also that reminds me so mid semester grades, therefore, will be. Um, pretty much just based off of uh, exam one and all of the assignments so far. Um, so uh, for those of you for whom exam one wasn't uh, in a, a, a surprisingly good experience or whatever, um, that will that, that'll be reflected in your mid-semester grade. Um, but, but that is, if you look back at the syllabus, potentially as little as 10% of your final course grade. Um, so uh, you know, hopefully, uh, uh, just to keep that in mind as you're seeing your mid-semester grades. Um, so, uh, Sorry, do people have questions about grades, uh, assignments coming up, anything? Yes, yeah, what's up? When you say that you get bonus points for that OLI, yes. what, what's a bonus point? Ah, yes, a bonus point means that after I grade, uh, so, so at the very end of the semester, after I graded everybody's final exam and entered everything, I will, um, uh, I, figure out the grade, the grade cutoffs. They're gonna be pretty close to what's posted in the syllabus. Um, historically, they're pretty much always right around the same place. Um, so, and then once I've figured out the grade cutoffs, then I'll look to see who's done the OLI, and then I'll also grade those two bonus questions that are gonna be on the final related to the OLI, and, um, and it might bump you over, or you might have been just under a cutoff, it might bump you over after. Um, so, um, you won't even see those on Canvas even, uh, I'm, not, I'm not even going to be checking to see who's done the OI. I will check at the end to see who's done the OI. but I'm not even going to be checking to see who's done the OI. Uh, and then I'll just see who's completed each of the modules, and if you've completed the modules, you get a certain number of bonus points, and then I'll figure all that out after the entire the very good semester. Um, but the OI has, like I said in the emails, a lot more in-depth about a lot of topics than we go into in this class. The um, gene regulation one is really kind of relevant for last unit, and I was hoping that they would have it put together at the beginning of the semester, but delays outside of my control prevented it from being available. Um, but you can go back and do the gene regulation one um, if you want to review, especially since exam two is cumulative and may cover stuff that was from unit one. And then once you've done the gene regulation one, then the cancer one, uh, module seven, is very relevant for this. Again, it goes way more in detail, so you way more in detail than you need to, but, but, but if you want to learn more, that's great with me. Um, the pedigrees one, is good practice because you should be used to looking at pedigrees and figuring them out. Some of the groups took a while to figure out, for example, with the retinoblastoma pedigree that we saw, that you saw in the group assignments, was a dominant pedigree, but it is. You need like 13 carriers to make it recessive, and that doesn't happen. Um, so, yes. Um, so practice with pedigrees, that's very useful for the upcoming exam. There's some stuff about probability in the pedigree one as well, which you need to complete to get the bonus point, but you won't have to do on the exam. Does that all make sense? Questions about any of that? Yeah, sure. So there really isn't a deadline necessarily? Um, you need to do it before the final exam. Yeah, that's, that's in terms of the vote, in terms of points, it needs to be done before the final exam. If, yeah, if you do it after the final exam, then, then, uh, then it's not really relevant to the class. Other questions about any of that? Okay, so one other thing that I just wanted to mention is when we talked about, um, so, so I've tried when we were talking about dominant versus recessive genes at a cellular level. Um, so, um, cellular dominant allele 
is going to be one that has it, it has is a functional protein. Um, and uh, for cellular cellularly recessive alleles, that's non-functional uh, allele codes for non-functional protein. Um, I think I may have once or twice called them broken alleles, which is a little bit confusing because we, um, uh, uh, we're talking about damage to DNA a little bit um, and just P53 and how P53 senses damage to DNA. Um, and, so, uh, and so since P53 senses damage to DNA and bracket one and bracket two since like broken strands in DNA, um, Broken allele really just means like if you have a non-sense mutation or a, a sort of a, a most missense mutations that are not conservative are going to uh, are going to disrupt the protein's function and make it non-functional. Um, there are many different ways to render a gene non-functional. Um, if you happen to have damaged DNA where you have cross-linked bases or um, extra side groups or um, the double-stranded DNA is broken in the middle of a gene, that is actually another way to destroy a gene's function um, and render it non-functional. Um, but um, but you, shouldn't think of, you should think of non-functional as a broader category than just broken. And, and, and the, what the P53 and BRCA2 and so forth look for is, is um, any kind of DNA damage. That was just kind of a quick clarification. Um, okay, so what I want to do for today mostly is, is kind of, so the, the plan here written out for today through uh, Monday is um, to, uh, um, uh, actually I think, now that I've written it out, I think we're going to do this in slightly different order. I'm going to do this one first and then we'll come back to the recap of, of uh, integrants and integrants. Um, except for very briefly to mention them. Um, but um, there's, I think, still a lot of questions, especially generated by the discussion sections, about dominant and recessive organisms um, and cancer genes and R and RB and so on and so forth. Um, so, um, so I guess, yeah, we'll sort of uh, just sort of kind of briefly mention why we talked already about microtubules in the context of this unit and integrin proteins, and then especially focus in on these two topics about dominant recessive in organisms versus cells and the various cancer-related genes that we've talked about um, so far, um, and then also um, on Monday start talking about something called protein trafficking and some organelles within the cell and how um, and uh, and how that relates to microtubules and integrins that we've already. Uh, that the, the, the guest speakers uh, especially talked about. Um, so in terms of microtubules, um, one of the things that, uh, that Dika, the, the guest lecturer, mentioned is that microtubules, um, one of their jobs is to you get two um, uh, centrosomes that go to the two sides of a cell during um, as, as the cell is getting ready to undergo mitosis, um, and then they send out microtubules from those. Those microtubules grab hold of the chromosomes and pull apart the sister chromatids. Um, in mitosis. Um, and since cancer is essentially a disease of mitosis happening too much, um, that was part of the reason why I wanted to introduce microtubules in that unit. Um, the other thing, which we'll come back to more once we talked about protein trafficking a little bit, um, but um, we uh, mentioned a little bit about um, uh, tumors and then sort of the progression of tumors from like a benign tumor that maybe has a mutation in one or two uh, tumor suppressor and proto-oncogenes to a malignant tumor that's growing out of control where there are many tumor suppressor genes and proto-oncogenes to a metastatic cancer, which are the most dangerous ones, where now not only do you have this tumor growing, um, but parts of the tumor are breaking off and taking up residence in other parts of your body. Um, and in order to, so for example, if I have a tumor that begins to develop in my liver, initially those cells are dividing out of control, but they're staying in my liver. And the reason that they're staying in my liver is because there are um, desmosomes and um, what are called hemidesmosomes, these integrin to extracellular matrix junctions that anchor all of my liver cells to each other. The desmosomes are cell to cell connections and also to the extracellular matrix of collagen and everything that is in my liver. Um, and in order to break free of that, a cancer cell from my tumor needs to get rid of its integrins 
in order to get out and start metastasizing in other parts of my body. Um, and then once it takes up residence in those other parts, it actually has to start making more, it has to start finding the right integrin to, um, to embed itself in the new tissue as well, or um, uh, cadherin molecules, she talked about uh, uh, desmosome cadherin molecules, which are the way cells connect to each other. So integrins connect cells to the extracellular matrix, uh, desmosomes and desmosome-based adherent molecules connect cells to each other. Uh, and in order to get out of my liver, first the tumor cells have to lose the connections they have to the other cells and the connections they have to my liver's extracellular matrix. Then they get into my blood, and then they set up residence in a new tissue and start expressing new cell-cell uh, adhesions and new cell extracellular matrix adhesions to sort of stay put and create this new satellite tumor in the second part of my body. Yeah, sure. So when people talk about like stage one cancer, stage two, are those the stages, or is that something different? That is something different, and not being an oncologist, I don't know, yeah, I don't know exactly. I mean, the stages have to do with um, sort of like, uh, I think that, that stage, the metastatic, I believe, don't, I, I'm going to say something that's not even, it's like 50 percent likely to be wrong. But I think stage 3 and 4 can both be metastatic and there's different degrees of sort of malignancy. Uh, those are clinical terms that relate to sort of um, uh, how, how advanced the cancer is. Um, and, um, and so, um, like, I believe, and again, not being an oncologist, there's about 50 percent chance I'm wrong about this, that the benign tumor, where you have a few, uh, like maybe one um, tumor suppressor gene that you've lost both copies of and one proto gene has become overactive, I believe that that doesn't yet fall into a, even stage one cancer. And then before it metastasizes, there's sort of stage one and stage two, which is sort of like how likely it is to start to metastasize, and then once it's metastasized, how significant the leave is the dis distinction. But um, honestly, if Wikipedia says something different and you check them later tonight, then that's probably more right than me because I not. Yeah, like what? Like I, I, I know sort of the biology and like the cellular biology aspects of it, but the clinical diagnostic aspects of it are something that I don't really know very well. Yeah. Yeah. Can you kind of highlight again on when a proto-oncogene along the pathway becomes an oncogene? Yeah, so a proto-oncogene, I mean, so broadly speaking, pro, uh, the, our example proto-oncogene is, um, is ADL1. There's another thing called RAS that's a little bit more well studied that has essentially the same function. Um, but um, a proto-oncogene is anything that has a normal function usually related to cell division. And it gets a very particular, very sort of lucky or unlucky or whatever, very, very um, low probability missense mutation in it that makes it now active all the time. Again, like, um, like people pointed out in the homework, there are lots of ways to break a protein and render it inactive. If you inactivate a proto-oncogene, first of all, I have a second, so that's not a big deal to me. Um, but second of all, even if I lose both, then that just means one cell is not dividing. I'm pretty much okay with that, too. Um, but, um, but, in, uh, but an overactive proto-oncogene is, is when you start calling them oncogenes. Um, and so the, the, um, the way that we talked about sort of the, the, from the, the cell biology perspective of, of typical cancer progression. Um, is one cell loses um, both alleles of a tumor suppressor gene, then a little bit later on, um, uh, gain of function in some proto-oncogene and then from there you sort of progress into um, loss of more tumor suppressor genes and gain of function in more um, proto-oncogenes and then eventually um, loss of the integrins and cadherin proteins that, um, that Dika talked about that, that keep it still, keep it in its place in its, um, in its host tissue 
Um, and then it metastasizes, metastasizes, um, and then uh, and then needs to express new integrins, etc., to um, to embed, to take up to take up home in its new location. Um, and so the reason why, even though. So I talked about before. I have, you know, I have every cell in my body. Or when I when I was a conceived, when I was a, when I was a single cell, um, when sperm and egg met, and that was the beginning of me. Um, that had two working copies of p53. Um, as I've developed and grown to these 50 trillion, 20 trillion, whatever cells that you see in front of you, um, a million or so of them happen to not have happen to have lost one or the other copy of p53. Um, those cells aren't problems until, unless one of them happened to have lost both its copies. Um, but um, because um, loss of function mutations are so much more likely than gain of function mutations, most cancers begin with a single cell that does happen to be unlucky enough to lose both copies of a particular tumor suppressor gene. Right? That's more likely than that gain of function in a proto-oncogene. Once this happens, though, then the cell stops checking for damage. And so a lot more mutations are going to be arising in the cell. And that's when it starts to become likely that one of its uh, descendant cells will gain function in a proto-oncogene. Because cells are so carefully looking for mutations, and gain of function mutations are so rare, it's very unlikely to pick up that one gain of function much easier to break both copies of people. <coughs> Does that so, um, make sense? Okay. Um, I like the top of that you highlighted there. Looks like yeah. the first one B basically, um, uh, oh, okay, there. Or is that like loss of uh, tumor suppressor genes? More tumor suppressor genes. So, but the first one, though? So oh, yeah. Would be like that feedback inherited mutation? No, this would be, this, yeah, this, we're not talking about inherited here. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, yeah. That so would be like the first one. Right. Yeah. This is so. So far, we're not even. Let's not even worry about inherited cancers. This is just like a random bad luck. Uh, you know, you're out sun. You're out sun tanning too much. You can cancer. Yeah. Sure. Carcinogens like um, most carcinogens mutate DNA. They and so and so by mutating DNA, you're likely to start losing function in genes. Losing function in genes again. Losing function in genes can be bad news for cells, but usually. If it, most most mutations are a lot of mutations are going to be conservative in the first place. If they're not conservative, then they're going to destroy some protein. And a lot of those, if they destroy a protein, especially if they destroy both copies of a protein, might kill the cell because it might be a critical protein that the cell needs to survive. But for me, as my 20 trillion cells, I can stand that. The time when I run into trouble is when I've got loss of function in both copies of a tumor suppressor. That's something where now it's not critical for that. that then that cell's not dying, it says it's becoming a threat to me. Um, yes, Sandra, you already guessed. Yeah, um, so actually, this is kind of going back to what you said before. Yeah. But um, I think that there's a lot of people that are talking about. Is that just the type of integrins? Um, no, the desmosome is so desmosome is cell to cell connections, oh. and integrins is cell connecting to the extracellular matrix. Okay. Yeah. They, they, they need to lose bulk to sort of break free, and then to embed in the new tissue, they need to start expressing different ones. Yeah, and so, and so different cells in your body will have different versions of cadherins that they express, and different versions of integrins to keep them in their proper tissues, or, yeah. Yeah. So following up on the question, actually, how does this cell know what signal does the cell receive? so that it knows what specific adherence and desert to express? That is a great question, and the answer is it doesn't. Um, in fact, what's going to happen is by the time the tumor starts metastasizing, the cells have lost a number of tumor suppressor genes and are dividing very quickly. And as a result of that, they are making tons of mistakes in their, in their, gen, in their DNA and having tons of random mutations. They're putting up random, the, the regulation of which in an integrin gets turned on and off is like just totally going nuts, right? And so, and so yeah, and so you have millions and millions of cancer cells putting up random integrins here and there. And whichever one happens to land in an organ and it happens to put up the right integrin, that one's going to stay. And then once it stays, 
then it's going to keep dividing, and its daughter cells and granddaughter cells will have that same integrin expressed until they start to mutate more. Um, so it's it's the same thing as it's it's, it's like almost exactly the same thing as how uh, bacteria develop resistance to antibiotics. If I uh, have a petri dish or have a have a have a flask filled with a bunch of bacteria and I put some antibiotic in there, the bacteria don't know, don't sense the antibiotic and like learn to adapt to it. Just by chance, there's a couple bacterial cells in there that already were resistant to it. Um, those couple bacterial cells were actually maybe even at a slight disadvantage to their neighbors because they're making some protein to metabolize an antibiotic that's not in the environment. Then I change the environment, put the antibiotic in, those are now all of a sudden the big winners, and then they replicate like crazy. And so it's the same thing happening with cancer. Cancer cells, most tumor cells die very quickly because they're making a lot of random mutations. Those random mutations are much more likely to kill them than to make them more malignant. It's just that the ones that persist in your body are the ones that make the sort of unlucky or unlikely mutations that keep them persisting in your body or let them take up residence in a new organ or whatever it is. That's a, that's a difficult concept. Worth everyone sort of being aware of and thinking about when you're thinking about cancer. So like, it relies uh, with many things. There's a lot of random chance involved. And, and once you're dealing with cancer, though, you've got millions of cells rolling millions and millions of pairs of dice, and then, and then um, a lot of them get destroyed by your immune system, which we'll talk about a little bit next week. A lot of them um, get, um, get broken. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Yes? How uh, can, like, certain viruses or, like, bacterial infections, like, exaggerate the probability of cancer? It's complicated. That's, yeah, that's a long answer. <laughs> if, you take a, if you take the cancer biology class, then you can get it. They spend about two weeks on that, the cancer biology class. I'd be happy to talk about it, talk about it with you for a little while. What's like the norm, though? Like, is the virus, like, in itself affecting the DNA? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes the virus does cause mutation. Yeah. yeah. That, that's the most common thing. Okay. Okay, okay, so, okay, so now, all right, so that was our brief recap of, of the, um, okay, so dominant recessive in organisms and cells. Um, so I think, I mean, this was, this was a very challenging thing, and this was intentionally challenging and why I had to work in discussion groups to kind of work through this, but I did want to kind of recap this a little bit. If we, for a moment, stop talking about cancer and just ignore that cancer is a thing, um, there, um, there's, I think, one other example that, we, that I'd have to talk about with people af, uh, outside of class that, that we don't have to worry about, but uh, setting aside cancer and a couple other weird situations, um, um, functional, so, so, this, this is true 100% of the time, at least when we're talking about simple dominance, when we're talking about situations where, um, you know, one copy is sufficient to get a job done. So that's true 100 copies, 100% uh, of the time. Um, we say, aside from cancer, functional alleles that code for functional proteins um, are dominant um, for an organism too. And similarly, non-functional alleles, the code for non-functional proteins, are recessive for an organism. So, um, going back to the demonstration from a couple weeks ago with that bitter tasting paper, um, I happen to, to know that I'm a heterozygote with the ability to taste that paper. Um, and I can taste it just as well as somebody who's a homozygote. There are um, about a fifth or so of, cell of, the, of the taste buds in my tongue are searching for and tasting for bitter compounds. Um, and those cells are all expressing a number of different surface proteins um, that detect various bitter compounds in the extracellular environment. Caffeine is another bitter compound that they can detect and taste. Um, the aminocarbonide on my cells, they can detect and taste it. There are dozens of other bitter compounds out there in the environment that these cells can taste. And the reason that 
I as an organism can taste phenothiocarbamide is that those cells in me all inherited one working copy of that gene and therefore they express that protein and therefore they can sense the pig. Does that all make sense to everybody? Okay. Um, so, Mauricio, could you taste the stuff? Yeah. Yeah, you can taste the stuff. All right, so let's pretend you're a homozygote for this. Right, so, so here, this is me. My genotype is this. Um, uh, my wife's genotype is this. And Mauricio, uh, we'll just pretend you're homozygote. All right, so um, question for all of you is if you looked at a microscopic level at my tongue at every single cell that is supposed to be tasting bitter in my tongue, um, would you find in my tongue any bitter sensitive cells in, in my tongue, that I probably just spelled, um, that can't taste this phenothiocarbamide. That's sort of the first question. What about, and then what about in Mauricio's tongue? Did you find any there, and why and why not? And then, um, and then also, in, in sort of converse question, my wife's tongue, would you expect to find any cells that do taste this compound? And so, looking at those genotypes, um, let's spend maybe, uh, let's call it seven or eight minutes, working through all three of these questions and give a justification for each.
There have been a lot of great questions that people have as I've been walking around here. So, okay, so, um, did, did, diving into my tongue here, um, if you go in and look cell by cell, look at all the bitter cells and put the bitter sensitive cells in my tongue. Um, uh, any thoughts about if, you're, if you might come across some in my tongue that, that as an individual cell cannot taste that substance, even if they should be supposed to? Yeah. There could be a recessive mutation in the cell function of that illusion. Right. Yeah, sure. Exactly. So, um, so by random, by mistakes happen, biology's messy, and um, all of my cells in my tongue have one functional copy. If they pick up a mutation, in that one functional copy, then that one cell becomes insensitive to this compound. I have like, let's say, a million bitter sensitive cells on my tongue, so me as an organism, I'm not going to notice that one or two cells in my tongue have lost the ability to taste this compound. And so I taste it just as well as Mauricio tastes it, even though he's homozygous. Um, but, um, but, one or two of my cells can't taste. Does that make sense? What's going on with that? Okay. Um, what about Mauricio's mouth? What if we go digging into his tongue? Yeah, sure. Um, all of his cells should be able to taste it because it's like really extremely likely that both dominants. Right. All the cells should be able to taste it. It's very likely that both that both dominant. That's a great description of that. One follow-up question to it: If we go genotype every single cell in his mouth, what might we find there? Yeah, sure. Uh, we might find a couple of big T little T's, but we couldn't find any T little T's because the chances right. of both of them mutating are pretty Yeah, so yeah, small. exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so. Um, just like me, I was born with two working copies of P53, I was born with two working copies of RB, the retinoblastoma protein allele. Um, if you go into my eye and dig out every, every um, uh, retinal epithelial cell in my eye, you will find a couple of them have one non-functional copy of that retinoblastoma allele. But, the, but I don't have tumors in my eye because I was born with two working copies of it, and so there's that backup. And so no cell in my eye ever gets to the double recessive state, or unless I'm really unlucky. What about my wife's mouth? You go, uh, yeah. You probably wouldn't find any cells. Okay, why, why do you think that? Um, it's really unlikely to get a gain of function mutation. Right, so, so the idea is that, that it's, the, the gain of function is, is super unlikely, much more unlikely than the loss of function. Do, they, do, they, do other groups come up with the same idea, a different idea for this? Okay, yeah, so um, I mean, this is a subtle point, but it's, so again, we need one mutation to find in one cell to get a, a taste sensitive, uh, a, a, a sensitive one. In, you know, of all the people in, uh, on this campus, all, all I don't know, 3,000 people on the CMU campus who are non-tasters, we might find one cell in one person's tongue that's picked up that gain of function mutation. Um, but um, but uh, gain of function mutations are super duper rare, and so in a typical person who's a non-taster, there's not even a single cell there that's sensitive. That make sense? The distinction between that. Um, okay, so then why? So now this is this is the next question for, for everybody. Um, why then for tumor suppressor genes are they recessive for? Does this does this break down? This this they're recessive for the cell but dominant for the organism. Why is a tumor suppressor gene recessive for the cell but dominant for the organism? Actually, let's take maybe two minutes to try and like think about that. Why does why does a cellularly recessive mutation, if you inherit it in all of your cells, give you a physical dominant manifested phenotype in your body? So go ahead and talk about that with your group. <laughs> I'm <laughs> sorry. 
Okay, so, uh, yeah, let's you finish up your discussion about that. So we think we want to volunteer with the group came up with on this. Uh, you actually have a chance to talk about it. Yeah. Speak for somebody further back. Sure, yeah, that's up. Um, if you only have like one functional copy of the tumor suppression, if that uh, mutation becomes non-functional, then um, that cell would like uh, develop into a tumor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so and so what the reason why this breaks down is so for me, right, my tongue. <laughs> there are a few non-taster cells in my tongue, but those non-taster cells in my tongue don't have any impact on me as an organism that I can detect. A phenotype is something visible, observable, and the only time in biology, basically, when a single cell in a big organism like me um, change can, can have an impact on the organism is when it starts dividing out of control, and we call that cancer. So, so that is that is why cancer is the exception to this rule of function. So, this functional deals functional proteins. Cellular dominant, that always is true, even with cancer. Non-functional alleles, non-functional proteins, cellular recessive, that all connects 100% of the time, even with cancer. The connection between cellular dominance and organismal dominance, or cell, cell, in, 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 with cancer, you can have something that is recessive on the single cell level, but then when you're dealing with a 50 trillion or 20 trillion or whatever cell, uh, cell large organism, that is going to basically guarantee that at some point that organism is going to have a cell that divides out of control. Right? So if these, if these, uh, if these another way to say that is if those three or so phenothiocarbamide instancing cells on my tongue were growing out of control into tumors, then I would notice that. Um, but since they're just three out of a million cells that can't taste some stuff, I don't notice it. And so we don't call that a phenotype. Does that make sense? This is sort of like the big challenging idea from the last discussion section, yeah. Um, so then, you're back to make, you're making that that, like, one Right, so, right, and that's, so in, for an organism, the, the proper definition, um, Cover this up for a second so that we can sort of talk about. But so, so for, for an organism, dominant means one allele. Oops, one allele uh, translates to a particular phenotype. Um, and and if there were no mutations as you, in your cells as they underwent mitosis and whatever, then, then, then this would always be the same um, as, as cellular dominance. And then organismal recessive just means you need two copies to have this. And so one defunct, one, sorry, one, one um, um, non-functional allele of the retinoblastoma um, gene is sufficient to give you an organism level phenotype, which is cancer in the eyes. Does that, does that, Make sense? Right, so yeah, that, that gets to sort of the next point. Um, so I'll try to maybe leave that up a little bit um, so that you can see that. Um, uh, sorry, kind of covering this a little bit. But, um, but there were a couple questions about the sort of relationship and, and interconnection between these. So um, ABL1 is the only one that we've talked about that's a proto oncogene. That means that mutations in it. First of all, they need to be just the right mutation, the very unlikely they need to be gain of function mutation. But if that happens, then that then that is a dominance on a cellular level going to going to make the cell um, start to be um, at risk of becoming cancerous. Um, retino uh, RB retinoblastoma one non-functional version of the retinoblastoma allele. It turns out that that is mainly involved in just regulating cell division just in the eye and not very many other places, which is why a non-functional version of that puts your eyes at risk of cancer more than anything else. Um, in addition to that, um, uh, yeah, so, 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 and so, that, and so that's why it's sort of one non-functional allele sort of puts you in trouble with that. Um, for P53, 
in order to survive, you need to inherit two copies. And the reason is that P53, the book spends a lot of time about this, um, but this is sort of like the, the, the master control on, um, on protecting against DNA damage. So basically all types of DNA, there, there's a little bit of redundancy, but P53 is, is the most critical protein for, for preventing DNA damage. And again, DNA damage means more mutations, means more likely that you're going to have more tumor suppressor genes gone, more proto uh, the, 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 the really unfortunate gain of function mutations in proto oncogenes and so on. So if you're not watching for DNA damage, you're in trouble. Um, and so, so if, um, for example, if uh, a sperm cell by random mutation is carrying a, a, a loss of function allele in P53 and it fertilizes an egg or vice versa, the egg has a random loss of function mutation, then that fetus, as it develops, is going to be turning into a ball of tumors before it's even born um, because it's one copy down already, and, it's, and a few cells are going to lose that second copy even before the organism is born. Um, and so P53 is so critical that we don't ever even see people being born deficient one copy. Retinoblastoma is not quite so critical for survival, which is why we sometimes see people, sometimes have people, there, that there are people who were born deficient in one copy. Um, there were also some questions about retinoblastoma in BRCA2. BRCA2 has some redundancy, it's, so one of its jobs is to prevent against certain types of DNA breaks and DNA damage as well. But because there are multiple sort of semi-redundant systems, um, if you're missing a copy of BRCA2, you are pretty much guaranteed to have cells in your body that lose that second copy. But those cells are not guaranteed to become cancerous in quite the same way that a cell that's lost both copies of P53 is. And so, um, or that a retinal cell that's lost both copies of RB, where retinoblastoma is very important for regulating cell division is. And so, um, and so that's why with BRCA2 we have this something we call incomplete penetrance, which is a little bit beyond the scope of this course, but it essentially means that um, from an organism's perspective, Having one bad copy is trouble, but it's not guaranteed trouble, it's just a risk of trouble um, for, for, for BRCA2. Um, it's a pretty big risk, right? It brings your risk of getting breast cancer by age 40 from something like 1% up to something like 50%, which is a pretty scary, like absolute number, not just like a 50% increase, meaning that you go from one to one and a half or whatever. Like, like legitimately half the people who have that end up with cancer by the time of breast cancer by the time of 50, uh, by the time of 40 or 50 years old. Um, uh, and also increases the risk of certain types of prostate cancer, ovarian cancer, uh, uh, and so on. Um, uh, but, but anyway, um, since BRCA2 isn't like the most critical DNA damage protein, that's why it's like a risk rather than a guarantee. Yeah, there are a couple hands up. Yeah, sure. If the DNA damage is in what? It's um, in terms. Well, yeah. In terms of well, this is where this is where BRCA2 is begins to illustrate an example. But there are other things that might increase your cancer risk not by fifty percent but by one percent. And so something like that could be passed down many generations before you start that. So if you have a family history of cancer, then that probably means that you have like. Um, uh, 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 even less critical protein than the ones that we've talked about that's carrying uh, this um, Yeah. Um, okay, so class uh, so just before we leave, a couple quick announcements. Um, I actually have to run really quickly to a meeting, so if people have questions, you're going to have to send me an email. But um, the exam reflection assignments, Mauricio has those in the back. Please pick those up for him. And then also give him your group discussion assignments from what you were talking about earlier. Don't go nuts. Here. 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 Why do you do that? You. Yes. A, B, C's. X, Y, Z. In classes.
Thank you.